Hello, everybody. Can you all hear me okay? I should be on the mic. Uh, my name is Maureen Warren. I'm curator of European and American art here at Cranet Art Museum, and I welcome you this Valentine's Day to this excellent lecture. I'd like to begin uh, by stating that Cranert Art Museum, as part of the University of Illinois, stands on the lands of the Peoria, Kaskaskia, Pickasha, Wea, Miami, Muscoutin, Odawa, Sauk, Masaki, Kickapoo, Potawatomi, Ojibwe, and Chickasaw Nations. These lands were the traditional territory of these indigenous nations prior to their forced removal, and they continue to carry the stories of these nations and their struggles for survival and identity today. As part of a land-grant institution dedicated to promoting the critical power of art in the past and present, Cranert Art Museum has a responsibility to acknowledge the peoples of these lands, as well as the histories of dispossession that have allowed for the growth of this university over the past 150 years. We also recognize the particular role they have played in this history. Using our collections, programming, and collaborative relationships, we seek to address and reflect on these histories and the role that the U of I continues to play in shaping them. Uh, I'd like to welcome this evening Dr. Stacy Pearson. Uh, she is here in conjunction with the exhibition Blue and White uh, Ceramics, a global uh, obsession, which is on view through August 31st, so I hope you take a look if you haven't already. Uh, I think it's apt that we're celebrating Chinese ceramics and porcelain in particular today on Valentine's Day. It's certainly something that I'm fondly in love with, and I <laughs> hope that you develop even more fondness over the course of the next hour. Um, Dr. Pearson, we're very lucky to have her. She's one of the world's foremost experts on Chinese porcelain. She is senior lecturer in the history of Chinese ceramics at the School of Oriental and African Studies at the University of London. She served as curator of the Percival David Foundation of Chinese Art, which houses one of the foremost collections of Chinese ceramics outside of China, uh, which is now uh, on loan at the British Museum. I urge all of you to visit. And she's published widely. Now, I would read to you her very long and extensive CD. It's very impressive. But I'm just going to hi highlight the one thing I have most enjoyed, um, from object to concept, global consumption, and the transformation of Ming porcelain. It really is accessible to a wide audience and riveting, even if you don't have quite the bug for porcelain that I do. Um, I'd also like to thank our generous co-sponsors for this event the Center for East Asian and Pacific Studies, and the Laredo Taft Lectureship on Art Fund at the College of Fine and Applied Arts. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Pearson. Well, thank you, Maureen, um, and welcome, everybody. Tonight, I would like to tell you the story of Chinese blue and white porcelain. And it's a story that I want to start with from its humble beginnings in the 8th to the 9th century, to its development as an imperial product in the Ming Dynasty, to its emergence as a worldwide product through export from the Ming Dynasty onwards, up to its status as a cultural icon today. So this will be a kind of chronological overview, focusing on its production in China. Um, but I think you'll find that much of what I'm going to say tonight will actually help you to better appreciate the exhibition that's on view. Um, which I was really impressed with, I have to say, because um, it really kind of gives you a, a wonderful global perspective on blue and white as a style, um, but also on ceramics themselves. So our story begins with a shipwreck. Now, in 1998, fishermen diving for sea cucumbers off the island of Belitong in Indonesia discovered hundreds of ceramics and precious vessels on the seabed. Now, when this site was excavated, um, and studied, it was discovered that it was the remains of a cargo of a 9th century Arab ship. Now, in the cargo remains, they found these amazing gold and silver vessels, which was really stunning. And these have a very particular style, and it tells me that they're of the type that you find in what are called relic deposits. So in temples in China at this time in the 9th century, um, people would give gifts to the temple um, 
for ritual and for good fortune, and these would be buried in the crypt normally, often with relics, and the relics would be allegedly the finger bones of the Buddha, for example. So these are quite familiar, but it's interesting to see these on a shipwreck that was obviously had left China. So gold and silver specialists get really excited about these, but I, as a ceramic specialist, got much more excited about these because they found three blue and white dishes in the remains of the cargo. Now there may have been more, but of course they, it was on the seabed, so it had been disturbed. Um, but these three were such a surprise because they're the only intact blue and white vessels from this date that were made in China. So these are the earliest surviving whole pieces of blue and white. And the wreck has been dated to about 826, so we now have a secure date for the production of the first blue and white in the world. Now, if anyone in the audience is a specialist in Islamic ceramics, I'm sure you will disagree with me, but I have proof that these are earlier than the ones that um, were made in Islamic ceramic tradition. So we had actually known about these blue and white pieces since the 1970s, um, but only from those fragments. And these small fragments were found in the remains of an area that's in a coastal part of China. Um, so it does appear, however, now that they've discovered where they were made in China as well, that these were made for local consumption in China, but also for export in the early ninth century. Now, I think it's interesting to think about those fragments and how they developed into these kind of spectacular pieces, because that's where this tradition started. It's the aesthetic as well as the wares themselves. So you know, I hope you recognize the one on the far left. Yes? OK, good. Um, we'll talk about that one more later. But all of these are very important examples of what blue and white would develop into from those early pieces. So from those fragments, we can see that the, they became imperial porcelains. And all of these are actually imperial. The one in the middle is, has been placed in the, a silver stand that's deteriorated, and it had a special gold lid made for it. So it was buried in an imperial tomb in the early 15th century. But I think in order to understand that journey from the 9th century onward, I need to take a step back and really talk about what blue and white is, particularly from a Chinese perspective. So if you'll bear with me, we're going to do a tiny bit of material science for the next five minutes. So what exactly in ceramic terms is blue and white? So by definition, it's porcelain or white stoneware that's been decorated with cobalt blue pigment under the glaze. Now what that means is, if you look at the image on the right, that's a photograph I took through a microscope of the bottom of a early Ming dish. And it has a Chinese character for year on it. And can you see it's covered with bubbles? So the blue is actually under a layer of glaze. Now in order to produce that, there's a very specific technique. And potters in the audience might be familiar with it, but in case you aren't, if you look at the slide on the left, that shows you how you produce an underglazed decorated vessel. So the one on the far left, you make your form, it's a simple dish, let it dry slightly, and then in the next image, as you can see they painted it with a kind of leaf design in iron pigment. And then the third image is all white because they've dipped it in glaze, but the glaze is opaque because it hasn't been fired yet. And then when you fire it, the glaze becomes transparent, and you can see the decoration under that layer of glaze. So it's actually a very practical technique as well because it protects the decoration. It makes it permanent. So that's the technique. What about the pigment? So just a tiny bit of science. Um, so cobalt, as you probably know, is a metal when it's a free element, but it's not found in nature as a free element. So it's found in mineral ores. Um, that is, it's found with other elements like iron and manganese. And as a pigment, it's used as an oxide. So it's a colorant for glass forming material, silicate. Okay, bear with me. <laughs> and as a colorant, it is the most powerful one but in the glass and glaze making repertoire. It's so powerful that, I mean, I sometimes can't believe that statistic when I see it, that it creates strong blues in as little as 0.0005% 
Okay, imagine how strong that pigment must be. But that's why it's used so often. So it's very strong. You don't need to use a lot of it. It's very predictable. It's not going to change color. You know, depending on whatever base you're putting it in, whatever temperature or atmosphere you're firing at. So it's, it's a really predictable color. And therefore, it's not just aesthetically pleasing, but technically, it's a very good product to be making. So where did the cobalt come from? Now, in the history of Chinese ceramics, you read a lot about cobalt coming from Persia. Um, that's one of the common myths. Now, it's possible that some of it came from Persia. Um, and there are Chinese sources, who I blame for this myth, um, from the 16th century, which use a name for cobalt um, that equates to the name they use for a place in Iran, which is known as Kemsar. Um, it's near Kashan. And at Kemsar, there are cobalt mines. However, there are lots of different profiles for cobalt in the area, so you don't know which one they use. And it is similar to the cobalt that's used for local ceramics that were made in as Persia as was. And that's a good example that's in the Royal Ontario Museum in Toronto. Um, but similar cobalt have been found in China as well. So there are sources of this cobalt elsewhere besides Persia. So it's possible. Um, but as those of you who are mineralogists would probably know, it's really difficult to find the source of a particular mineral, particularly one if you're trying to test for it today, one that was used back in the 15th century, possibly in Persia. So it may be Chinese sources, it may be imported, but either way, it's a pigment that produces a very strong color and one that became universally liked worldwide. So the first time you see it being used in the consistently in the ceramic repertoire in China is during the Tang Dynasty from 618 to 906. Um, most of the surviving examples, those pieces we saw from the shipwreck and the ones they've excavated from the kiln sites, um, date from the 8th to the 9th century, so the later part of the dynasty. And it was introduced into a kind of wider color palette at the time. If you look at the image on the left, you see the box with the flowers on the top that has a blue background. So that's been Mu's been added to a palette that's known as three color or santai in Chinese. Um, and many of those products were made for everyday use, for export, and for funerary purposes in the Tang period. Interestingly, if you look at the one at the back, you can see they also started producing the color combination blue and white on its own. So those are that's where this particular aesthetic comes from. However, you can see they're also using blue as a monochrome or single color at the same time. Um, interestingly, the blues from that period, if you're ever trying to identify a date of a piece, they're slightly green. Um, because in order to produce those bright colored glazes, they're really high in lead. And so any iron that's present with the cobalt gives the greenish tinge to it. Um, and it's one thing I've noticed that the fakers never get right, is that greenish tinge. So look out for it. So it's really becomes a fairly common product in ceramics in the Tang period. But for some reason, after the end of the Tang period, it disappears. Um, you don't see that color combination in Chinese ceramics for several hundred years. And you don't see blue being used much in Chinese ceramics. And it's really not until the next period, interestingly, when the Mongols conquered China, that you begin to see um, the return of blue and white as a ceramic product in China. So during the Yuan Dynasty, as it was called, it was revived. Its production was, was centered, however, in the south of China. And it became a major export product from that area in the 14th century. And that area is known as Jingdezhen. It's still the home of porcelain today. Um, if you go to Jingdezhen, everything is made of porcelain. The street lamps are made of porcelain, the sinks, the toilets. I mean, blue and white, it's, it's really quite disconcerting sometimes. There's so much blue and white everywhere. But they're very proud of their heritage because they've been producing it since the Yuan Dynasty. And they were making a wide range of blue and white products. One of their biggest markets at that time were countries in the Middle East, including um, Central Asia and west of that, so West Asia. And one of the 
most important surviving collections in the Middle East from that time is now in the National Museum in Iran. Um, and that's one of the pieces that's from that collection on the left, um, which is a large flask. Its shape imitates leather, by the way. And it was acquired perhaps during not long after it was produced, and it remained in the Persian world collections up until, you know, basically the Iranian Revolution. So it is one of hundreds of blue and white pieces that were in that collection. Another big collection was formed by the Ottomans in Turkey. So the market for these products was worldwide, as we'll see, but the major consumers were in the Middle East. Now, it doesn't exclude pl places in Asia like Japan and Southeast Asia, where Yuan period blue and whites have also been found. One interesting site, which is now Japan, is Okinawa. And in the 14th century, Okinawa was a very important trading port um, and a kind of trading entrepot for multiple different countries. And they have found 250 Yuan blue and white jars in sites all over, castle sites in Okinawa, including that one that was found in a tomb. So in an, a tomb in Okinawa, they had this piece of blue and white porcelain that most people would look at and say, oh, that's typical Chinese porcelain for the Middle East, but actually it was found in a tomb in Japan. They've also found fragments of a number of jars in Singapore. And we know that from textual sources that there was a Chinese community in Singapore in the 14th century. So perhaps it was for Chinese consumers overseas. And that's an important market that we should try and remember when we think about the export of blue and white. But blue and white, of course, was also being made it for the Chinese consumers in the 14th century. And interestingly, a number of them are very special pieces, including these two, which are arguably um, the most famous and most important blue and white porcelains in the world. And the reason is because of the inscription right at the t on the neck. So both of them have an inscription which dedicates them to a temple, and because they're a temple dedication, the inscription has a date, and the date is 1351. So they are securely dated to the very end of the Yuan period, and they're decorated all over with all the patterns you would expect from that period. Um, their popular name in English is the, well, I'll have to say it like the British, the David vases, um, because they were both owned by Sir Percival David, um, who's pieces you will see throughout the lecture, because I can't help it, I was the curator, so uh, this is kind of my benchmark. Um, and he acquired them from two different collectors and realized that they should have been a pair. Um, but they would have been a, a temple set to place on an altar with a large incense burner as the third piece, and no one's ever found the third piece, so keep an eye out. If you find a third piece with that inscription on it, it would be worth an absolute fortune, I can assure you. Um, but thinking more about the decoration, so these would have been specially commissioned pieces. So the decoration needs to have been appropriate for that purpose. So a lot of it's very auspicious. Um, and you can see along the bottom, I've done a detail there, there's these interesting wave patterns. Now those wave patterns became really popular in blue and white in this particular period. And you can see them on another jar that represents a second type of blue and white that was being made for Chinese consumers in the 14th century. And you can see the wave just along, just below the, the mouth rim on the neck. And this is an example of a type that was very fancy at the time it was made um, because it relates to um, popular literature and famous stories from the past. So the image you can see along the middle of it that wonderful kind of narrative scene with a gentleman in a cart with being dragged by a tiger and a leopard um, comes from a very famous, famous story from the third century BC. Um, and that story had been recently published in these popular illustrated volumes that came out in the 14th century that are known as pinghua or plain tales. And you could either read the story and then look at the pictures, but if you couldn't read, you could also appreciate the story from the pictures. And this particular story was one that would have been quite familiar to people because it was also performed in dramas and plays. And those of you who can read Chinese, you can see what it's called, but it's a story of um, 
well, do you know the art of war? Sun Tzu and the art of war. So Sun Tzu um, was kidnapped during a battle. And so the county where he was from sent an emissary to a famous military strategist, who's the guy in the cart, um, who was from a place called uh, Gui Gu. So he's known as Gui Guza. And he's come to rescue Sun Tzu. And he's always depicted coming in a cart, being dragged by two kind of felines. And it was a popular story at the time that people would be familiar with. But you had to be fairly wealthy to be able to afford to commission a piece like that, which translates the image from these popular tales. Saying that, they've taken the exact same format. So it runs along the top in a strip, and that's been applied exactly the same way on the jar. Um, so another interesting tidbit about this jar is that it um, sold for $20 million. <laughs> <laughs> Um, at the time, this was um, about 10 years ago, at the time that was the most expensive piece of blue and white in the world, but it's since been surpassed. Um, so at the end of the Yuan Dynasty, um, a native rulership takes over and that becomes the Ming Dynasty. But this is when you see a really significant change in the production of blue and white in China, and that's the advent of imperial blue and white. So it's in the very early Ming Dynasty when an imperial porcelain factory is built and established at Jingdezhen, so as early as 1369. And from then on, they start making imperial products that are blue and white, polychrome, monochrome. They start making porcelain at that time because the Ming has spent quite a long time defeating the Mongol Yuan. And the imperial coffers were basically empty, so they couldn't afford to be using precious materials like gold and silver and jade um, and bronze for their imperial vessels. So the first Ming emperor decreed that from that date, 1369, imperial vessels had to be made of porcelain, you know, until further notice. And that was a real stimulus for the production of blue and white. So Ming blue and white, um, there's a wide range of different markets for it. I want to concentrate just now on the imperial pieces because they're quite distinctive. Because they're imperial, they actually have very highly regulated designs um, and styles. Some would say that they're very conservative. Um, but what that means is that the motifs are restricted and how the motifs are depicted is restricted to the extent that even a dragon, there are several different versions of a dragon depending on your place in the hierarchy of the imperial family or the court. So the highest place, of course, would be the emperor. And so that jar on the right, um, which also sold for 20 million, um, actually that's a mistake, that's 20 million pounds. So it would be a bit more than that, um, with that 35 million. Um, that dragon has, do you see it has five claws? So within the hierarchy of dragon motifs, only the emperor can wear on his costume or be surrounded with the five-clawed dragon. Every time you hack one off, you go down in the hierarchy. So I guess if you're like a, a, a junior prince, you might only have like one claw. <laughs> um, but the five-clawed dragon is a very specific symbol you know, of a pure imperial authority. So not surprisingly, it appears on these imperial blue and white porcelain. Now that's one clue that it's imperial. Another clue is what you can see in the slide at the bottom. Um, do you see it has four characters on it? When they start producing imperial porcelain, they start branding it as you know, effectively made at the imperial factory. So that's only four characters. It says the name of the emperor, or the reign period that he ruled over. So that's the Shrender Emperor. So that's 1426 to 35, um, and it, the third character is, is like year, and the last one is kind of made in, so made during the reign of the Shender Emperor. And interestingly, so Christie sold that one, and they recently found, excavated one from the imperial, the remains of the imperial kiln at Jingdezhen. So you can see an almost identical one on the left. And that imperial dragon has a very distinctive style as well. It's very closely related to the dragon that you see, this is a small part of a giant scroll that's probably as long as this room, uh, called the Nine Dragon Scroll, which is now in um, 
in Boston, but it was formerly in the imperial collection and it was painted in the Song Dynasty and it's dated 1244. Now we know that um, a version of this was in the imperial paintings collection during the time of the Shuendo Emperor from when that jar was made. So it's entirely possible that this could have been used as a model for those dragons, particularly because that emperor himself was an artist um, and very eager to support the production of art and paintings at court and insisted that the court artists refer to you know, the important paintings of the past in their work. So we know that that was probably an inspiration. And then on the shoulder of the jar are these kind of monster mask type motif. And those also can be seen, have parallels in other imperial objects. Interestingly, in imperial kind of ceremonial arms and armor, such as that one. That one um, is in a military museum in England, but it has an imperial inscription on the uh, sheath of the sword. But the style of imperial blue and white is really very much dependent on the taste of the emperor. So the Schrender emperor, one could argue because he was an artist, he probably had quite sophisticated taste. That's not necessarily true with some of his successors. Um, no, I mean, we're not there yet. This is actually quite an important piece. And what I want to point out is that even though he had very sophisticated taste, it doesn't mean that bright colors and other sort of items were, were not also being made for the court. And it shows, however, there is a consistency in the imagery, which is very important. Um, so that's a, a really large jar that's in the British Museum collection. It also has a, hard to see, but a rain mark just under the mouth room. And the blue and white jar would have been pretty much the same shape with that type of lid. But the Schrender Emperor's pa own paintings as well are quite colorful too. So we shouldn't just assume that blue and white as an aesthetic was purely representative of his taste because some of his successors um, had questionable taste in um, imagery, including um, one of his successors who's known as the Jiajing Emperor who reigned from 1522 to 1566. Now, he was not an artist. His great passion was Taoism. But one particular aspect of Taoism really appealed. So an important concept in Taoist belief is um, kind of a quest for immortality. And that was accompanied by a lot of alchemy and the consumption in this particular emperor's case of um, elixirs said to guarantee your immortality and even better change you into, transform you into an immortal, like a deity. So he was really, frankly, quite obsessed with it, um, particularly in the second half of his reign. And he lived at this, in this palace called the West Park, where he insisted that Taoist immortality rituals be practiced 24 hours a day. So he ordered a lot of porcelains from the imperial factory related to these beliefs. Um, and so all over these two examples are kind of Taoist symbols. So the one on the far left, you see there's a god sitting in the middle with a giant forehead. So that's probably, if you're into immortality, the most important god to be familiar with. So he's known as Shou Lao, um, Shou being the, the word for long life. It's like long life old man. And he's always depicted as an old man with a long white beard and a very high forehead reflecting his wisdom. And he's surrounded by other symbols of Taoism, but he's kind of the focus of that jar. Slightly more subtle is the references on the bottle to the right, because that bottle, the shape is interesting. It's a traditional shape that's used to hold elixirs of any type, the double gourd. But do you see that branch, that twisting branch on the top part? That's the character for long life. Um, turned into a kind of branch that twists from a rock. It's also, one of my colleagues has pointed out, who's a specialist in kind of Taoist imagery, it's also meant to look like um, a kind of spiritual vapor, um, which is a reflection of the, um, the vapor that's popularly known as qi, a form of energy. And this particular motif was invented on imperial porcelain in the Jiajing period. So, Needless to say, he didn't live to an exceptionally old age because one of his favorite elixirs was mercury, 
So one has to imagine that in the, his last days were not very pretty, is all I can say. Um, but you can see how his taste had a really strong impact on imperial blue and white of that time. Now, moving aside from the imperial products, of course, during the Ming, there are lots of blue and white wares being produced for other markets. And you begin to see blue and whites like this one, um, which I hope you might recognize because a similar one appears in the painting that's in the blue and white exhibition. Um, which I'm sure Maureen can tell us a lot more about. It is an example of the type of wear that was exported all over the world, not just to Europe, from the late 16th century onward. Um, most of the ones we're familiar with appear in Dutch paintings or in um, Dutch collections, but they also went to Japan and Southeast Asia. So it's during the Ming period that you begin to see blue and white coming to Europe and having an impact on um, consumers there as well as ceramics. Now we know that some of the earliest blue and white to reach Europe went to Italy or what became the Italian states. Um, Lorenzo de Medici had blue and white in his collection um, and the Medici family in general um, were active consumers of Chinese blue and white. You see some of the earliest depictions of Chinese blue and white in Renaissance paintings like this one. Um, if you look at um, the cup that's just at the bottom, there's a detail of it, you can see a representation of what could only at that time have been Chinese blue and white because nobody else in the world was making blue and white. Nobody, of course, was making porcelain apart from China. Well, Korea was, but they weren't exporting it. Um, and so therefore, it's, it's depicted as a special kind of exotic, but also therefore very expensive object in this painting. And we also have to thank the Portuguese for making blue and white so popular in Europe at, during the Ming period, because they were the ones, of course, who were the real pioneers in establishing trading posts all over Asia. Um, just to give you some example, they had one in Hormuz in 1507, in Goa in 1509, and Malacca in 1511. They tried to get into China, but China had banned foreigners from about 1522 to 55. Um, but nonetheless, some intrepid Portuguese merchants and traders like Antonio Pejoto himself um, tried to get into China, was kicked out of China, but still managed to acquire Chinese products, including this really special blue and white pitcher or ewer. And it's special for several reasons. If you see on the main decoration is, an, is a, a family crest. So that's the crest of his family. It's one of the earliest known European crests on Chinese porcelain. And next to it is a view of the base of the vessel, which has a Chinese imperial rain mark on it. So interesting combination of designs, and it raises a lot of questions about access to imperial products. Um, it also interestingly has a silver lid, and the tip of the spout is silver. It looks like um, specialists have looked at it. Those are Turkish mounds, and they're contemporary with the pitcher. So it looks like it may have gotten broken on his return back to Portugal, and then he got it repaired on the way. Now, the Portuguese were also important because they um, not only controlled a lot of these trade routes, um, but they also performed a lot of diplomacy as a result. And one of the ones that it's quite important for this respect is John IV of Portugal, um, who reigned during the Restoration and the Thirty Years' War. He sent emissaries all over and with them diplomatic gifts, but he often used Chinese blue and white for these diplomatic gifts. And one of the most famous in the export porcelain world is this set of jars, which are in the Museum of Far Eastern Antiquities in Stockholm. Um, large blue and white jars that were given as a diplomatic gift to Queen Christina of Sweden. Um, now Queen Christina is a who because <laughs> um, she was quite a radical for her time and a contemporary text described her in a way that really sums it up. She was a queen without a realm, a Christian without faith, and a woman without shame. Now the reason she was described in that way is because she, did, she refused to get married. Apparently she dressed like a man. Um, but most importantly, she was Catholic, you know, in very Protestant Sweden. So she abdicated, moved to Rome, 
um, and became a kind of counter-reformation hero. And she's one of the few women who's buried in the Vatican. So she had taken over from her father um, when he died, and she became queen for a short period, and so she was in power when that diplomatic gift came from the Portuguese. But at the same time that all of this is happening, there's new competition now from Japan. So in the first part of the 17th century, Japan starts making porcelain and crucially starts making blue and white, specifically to compete with the Chinese. So we have lots of examples from the early period of production in Japan, including these two that are in the British Museum, where you can see the Chinese one on the left that was made for the Japanese market, and then on the right, the Japanese one imitating the Chinese one made for the Japanese market. So this was total industrial espionage um, and very successful at it as well because they were helped by some of the Europeans, including the Dutch, um, because the Dutch East India Company had been set up in the early 17th century. And in order to capitalize on China's weakness at this time, um, they started commissioning copies of Chinese blue and white from porcelain factories in Japan, stimulating production there, and really kind of flooding the market in Europe with these Japanese copies of Chinese blue and white. So <laughs> it all becomes very complicated. Um, but, and you know, today we can see the difference, but you know, it's hard to say whether consumers in Europe at the time would have known the difference between them. So how is this possible? Because in China, the 17th century was a period of great disruption. Um, it's often called the transitional period because this is when, um, for you know, a, a good 75 years, the Ming were constantly fighting with the Manchu, who would eventually establish the final dynasty, the Qing dynasty in China. Now, this of course affected porcelain production. So, the imperial factory itself ceased production in 1608. Um, a few brief commissions were um, completed after that, but very few. Jing Dezhen was destroyed in riots in the early 1670s, and therefore all the production there had to shift away from the court um, towards commercial factories and popular kilns, and they really put a greater emphasis on export. So there's a lot of disruption. Japan enters the market to fill the gap. Then when China can kind of the porcelain producers can get back on their feet. They're now competing with Japan for these same markets. So it really was a difficult time. Um, nonetheless, there were advantages to not having imperial oversight, and that saw new techniques and styles coming in. So when people think of this period, which they call transitional period, where they think of pieces like this, because what you can see now are unrestricted styles, these new forms, like these really simple, long vessels, like the one on the right. Um, a lot of interesting landscape designs, you know, moving away from dragons and imperial imagery. That landscapes that are taken from um, traditional landscape painting techniques. So, for example, that one, the landscape is kind of a, a kind of cascading monumental landscape that's imitating landscape styles from the 10th century in painting. Then you also see an improvement in the refining of minerals generally, including cobalt. So the, the much more pure cobalt is being used. And so you begin to see lots more tonal approaches to decoration on the blue and white. This one's quite important because it, it's a rare dated piece of the 17th century and it's dated by inscription to 1639. So finally though, um, in 1684, the Imperial Factory is rebuilt and Production resumes again, and you begin to see blue and white um, being made consistently for the court. But now, of course, it's a new court. And so this is now in the last dynasty, the Qing dynasty. And what you see are, particularly during three reign periods, um, in which there were emperors who were very interested in um, the style and quality of imperial products, including porcelain. So that would be the Kangxi, Yongzheng, and Qianlong emperors, mainly from covering the late 17th and all through the 18th century. So in the Kangxi period, what you see are the reintroduction or the return of imperial designs, um, including the dragon. What's interesting, though, is that the style changes a bit. Um, I have 
someone who shall remain nameless, um, but who did train me, who used to say, a good trick for identifying the Qing dragon is to imagine that it's water skiing. And that's what the posture is. But I look at it, because I'm from LA, I'm like, it's not water skiing, it's surfing, right? So that particular posture is quite distinctive. And you do see it, however, on imperial costumes. So it looks like that's the inspiration for the style. But what's also different is the porcelain is of exceptionally high quality. So you see a lot more of it showing now. The designs are simpler for the most part. And you can see the beauty of the white porcelain next to that really rich blue. Um, and of course, the rain marks are added again, but they're of the Qing. So that's the, the middle two characters are Kangxi Emperor. And then his successor, the Yongzheng Emperor, um, was really interested in styles from the past. And so now you see, and this gets a bit complicated, so the one on the right is the Qing one. Now you see Qing imperial copies of Ming imperial porcelain. <laughs> um, so the one on the right and the base of it is there on the left is early 18th century, so Qing. Um, the mark on it, however, is the mark of the early 15th century emperor that produced that dragon jar that we looked at. So in comparison, the original 15th century piece, there's a small one on the top. So it's, it's very similar. So it appears that they're copying actual pieces that have remained in the imperial holdings. But that was a fashion um, that you see across the imperial products from this particular time. Now, the one who um, is not known for his taste um, is the Qianlong Emperor. However, I would argue that there were some exceptionally fine blue and white pieces produced in his reign period, because he too was interested in the past, um, but in, a, in some ways in a much more sophisticated way, because what you see in blue and white here is something we haven't seen before. Um, it, impossible to see in a photograph, but in real life you can see that the blue it's not under the glaze, it's on top of it. So this kind of decoration is what we call overglaze enamel. And to do that, you need the purest blue pigments, and you need a very steady hand. It's really difficult to be painting that on a glossy surface. And painting it with such delicacy and technique, it almost looks like a pen and ink drawing. And that design on that dish is exactly copying the style of a landscape painter named Wang Hui, who's one of the famous four Wang painters who were court painters who painted in a very distinctive style. So to the right kind of viewer, this would have been instantly recognizable as the imitation of a very important painter's work in overglaze enamel on porcelain. So even though most Qianlong blue and white, frankly, is, is a little bit scary. Um, there are some truly exceptional pieces. But bear in mind that this is not what people outside the court are seeing. These are the exceptional, exclusive pieces. What the rest of the world is seeing um, is more like this material, which I'm sure is instantly familiar because so much of it went out of China in the 18th century. And that's mainly down to the European trading companies who finally had established bases, legal bases, in Canton in southern China. And just to give you an example, these pieces are all from a shipwreck known as the Geldermalsen, which was a Dutch East India Company ship that sank um, on its way home in 1752 in Indonesian waters. And it was discovered to be carrying over 150,000 porcelain. Saying that, that wasn't the main cargo. The main cargo was tea. Um, and these were used as ballast for the tea product. But that's why porcelain was such a great export product, because you could use it as ballast for tea shipments, and then you could sell it on. So it was useful and also profitable. Plus, they could buy it really cheaply in China. And it's because of these massive shipments that I would suggests that blue and white really became a kind of world style and a truly global product. And you can see that you know, in the second half of the 18th century when really ordinary pattern pieces like the one on the left, that's one that was in George Washington's um, dinner service collection, which is Chinese, but quite crude, nothing like the imperial pieces, 
but it has the pattern that inspired the one you see on the right, which is the so-called willow pattern. So it really did have an original Chinese source, but at Spode in England, they transformed it into a slightly more palatable version of a Chinese scene. And then, of course, all that exposure meant that other people wanted to compete in that same market. And so that's when you see Europeans and Americans, well, actually English moving to America, um, trying to find out how they can produce that same project product and make a profit on it. So it really had an impact on ceramic production outside China as well. But the ubiquity of it meant that it was becoming inexpensive. People were kind of falling out of, um, porcelain was falling out of favor with a lot of consumers. Um, saying that, though, it meant that it was affordable to people who wanted to use it in different ways. And in the 19th century, what you really see is people buying it in bulk, but as antiques and using it either to kind of, you know, decorate their walls or as props in painting. And so, of course, the person who really popularized that was James McNeil Whistler. And um, you can see one of his famous paintings where he's kind of populated it with Chinese blue and white. But he also um, designed a very famous interior, which is now, of course, in the Freer Gallery in Washington, um, for Frederick Leyland, um, rich industrialist who lived in London. And Whistler designed this dining room for him, you know, with his paintings, the focus, but the walls were then lined with blue and white porcelain. So it became part of the kind of visual landscape of the wealthy home, starting you know, as early as 1600 in Europe, but that continued in the 19th century. And so porcelain, particularly blue and white, the attitude towards it was changing. It was kind of divorced from China. It became China in the sense of China the product rather than China the place. And a lot of people were making fun of it, particularly in London, where um, everybody and anybody um, was decorating their homes with blue and white. They were writing plays about blue and white, stories about blue and white. Even Oscar Wilde was complaining about so much blue and white everywhere. So they actually called it China mania and complained about particularly those members of the aesthetic movement who were promoting blue and white. And after the 19th century, it became a, a problem in the sense that people stopped taking blue and white seriously as something that kind of sophisticated consumers should have in their home. But that really kind of enabled people to look at it differently. And it's the 20th century when you see blue and white really being considered art as opposed to pottery, as opposed to ceramic. And you begin to see much more scholarly work written about blue and white for the first time. And so the fact that it's fallen out of favor with collectors almost gave people license to treat it more seriously as art. And museums in England and America also began actively collecting blue and white. So you begin to see a, a number of publications about blue and white, many of which were promoted by um, the Oriental Ceramic Society in London. And I would argue that it's this that helped to transform blue and white into a cultural icon. And to the extent that um, you can see it in all different guises here, it's not just ceramics anymore. It's the inspiration for a dress by Roberto Cavalli. I'm guessing she's probably not happy with that picture now, but um, that's taken from an actual blue and white jar. And then the computer, I thought you'd be interested to see that because it's a computer version of the bottle that's in your exhibition. Um, that was in Taiwan about 10 years ago. <laughs> um, I saw it in a computer fair, I couldn't believe it. Um, and then there's also a, a New York interior designer who specializes in blue and white, and that's her decorative theme. So it kind of feeds into that continuous association of blue and white with um, the kind of luxurious, fancy interior. But you know that an object or an idea has really become ubiquitous if contemporary artists start to challenge it. So I'll leave you with this, which is um, Ai Weiwei at top and the bottom, who's you know, famous for subverting popular culture, um, has really taken on blue and white and, and treated it in ways that are somewhat unexpected. The jar at the bottom is, remember the early jar I showed you with the man in the cart with the tigers? He's turned them inside out um, and 
done some in red too. But in the middle, that's by another artist called um, Xue Lei, who then turned tin cans, like soda cans, into blue and white porcelain, or turned blue and white porcelain into soda cans. So it's become a topic now that is there to be challenged, but it just tells us how much blue and white has become part of the popular consciousness all over the world, really starting from those very humble beginnings in China in the ninth century. So I hope you'll agree that it has become an enduring global obsession. Thank you very much. Mm. Mm. We do have time for some questions. So if, <coughs> if anyone would like to ask questions, um, we have the expert on hand. Yes. Um, but it, I'm going to say a really pedantic statement. Um, it really depends which time period. So do you want me to just talk about it in general in China? Or? Okay, yeah. So Okay, that helps. Because um, I thought you were going to ask me a really tricky question about the different porcelains they were using in which period. So um, that question, it's actually a good one because there's a lot of blue and white made in you know, Islamic ceramic traditions or Middle Eastern ceramic traditions, um, including um, in the exhibition there's some Iznik ware, for example. That's a classic example of a glass-based body, which is what you're talking about. Um, because they didn't have the right clays, that is, kaolinitic white clays, which are the basis of porcelain production, um, they created a version of it that is glass-based as opposed to clay-based. So it's actually not, some of those, they're called fritware, bodies that are you find in Middle Eastern ceramics are really fine, particularly the ones that were made in um, Iran in the Seljuk period, would that be right? Yes, I think so. So 12th, 13th, 14th century, really fine white bodies that are imitating Chinese porcelain, whereas Chinese porcelain is a much simpler material. Um, again, depending on the time period, it's made from about, let's say those, those 18th century imperial pieces I showed you, those are made from about 50% porcelain clay and 50% porcelain stone. And it makes a really good, fine, well-behaved body. Yes. Mm. Japan, are they, where are they getting their porcelain? Ah, well, that's a, that's a long, I'll have to give you a long answer to that. So um, Japan and Korea have um, sources of porcelain stone, which you can also use to make porcelain without porcelain clay. Um, and so they had it locally. Um, you find porcelain clays in, okay, so I'm going to show my ignorance here. There's a place called Thuringia. Um, in what was part of Saxon Germany. Um, that's where somebody wrote a book about German porcelains. Yes. Can you say more about where the clay came from? <laughs> because it, it's from a specific place. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's actually very, um, um, it's a very specific place. Um, it's called Thuringia. Mm -hmm. And it's the place where um, Well, it depends on what material they were right. using, but you know, like the Vienna factory was getting clays by stealth from the Meissen factory. Yeah. Um, and there are some sources of porcelain clays in Central Europe. There's also some in the west of England um, in Cornwall. Um, but that's not to say that all these products were actually porcelain, because there's something called soft paste porcelain, which is slightly different. Um, so there's it's actually just a really complicated question. Yeah. Um, in the West, yeah. The Germans that made the German export of soft and porcelain, they took them to make pretty porcelain porcelain and like clay and make them pretty. And um, they had it. And they had it. They had it yeah. locally. Mm -hmm. um, and so they had um, it was very local. They had it locally. Um, and then, then the export started. And some of it got into Vienna. Um, 
Do we have any other questions? Yes. I had an almost blues, not the only blues, not the only decorative um, uh, aesthetic for porcelain. Oh, blue definitely not. No, I mean, you know, blue and white is only one style. Um, if you're talking about Chinese imperial products, even the commercial products from Jinji Jen, there is red and white, which is copper. Um, they also made various polychrome styles, um, which use a lot of different pigments, um, and of course, monochrome styles. So it's, it's one of many porcelain products. Mm -hmm. If you go on, on this gallery level, there's celadons, which is greens, and oxbloods, which is reds on view. You can see some in our decorative arts gallery. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, yeah it's, I always try and have to explain it when I'm in China. Because people always say to me, why blue and white? You know, because in, this, in the hierarchy of porcelain products in China, blue and white is not the highest. Um, so, but outside of China, it just became so popular. Um, and it's, it's really hard to say why, you know? Um, it's just that particular color combination was so popular elsewhere, yeah. <laughs> Yes, yeah, mm. but a lot of polychrome stuff was coming out at the same time as well. So um, maybe not in such great numbers, but it's interesting that um, it's kind of transcended European and kind of American taste because blue and white was not the most popular porcelain, Chinese porcelain product in Japan or Southeast Asia, but now, you know, it kind of has become that. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, I'd like to thank Dr. Pearson for her lecture, and thank you for coming this evening. Oh, thank you.